Good afternoon, everyone. We want to thank CFA Society for having us here today. My name is Damian, and I'm joined here with my teammates, Tyler, Luke, Riley, and Jack, and together we proudly represent Team One of the University of Minnesota to Luke. And now, come with us on this bumpy ride as we narrate our investment thesis on Polaris. We are issuing a sell recommendation on Polaris with a 12-month price target of $81, implying a 12% downside based on yesterday's close. So, why is this? Well, we conducted a rigorous proprietary research survey of 98 channel checks to Polaris deals across the United States, which led to our three catalysts, economic and consumer slowdown, supply chain mismanagement, and finally structural disadvantage compared to competitors. We will now introduce you to Polaris, headquartered in Medina, Minnesota. Polaris designs, engineers, and manufactures power source vehicles through three main segments. Off-road, primarily selling ATVs, side-by-sides, and snowmobiles. On-road, which includes the sales of motorcycles and three-wheel roadsters. And finally, marine, selling premium pontoon boats and deck boats. And now, Jack will discuss ESG. Thanks, Damien. For the industry that Polaris operates in, they are a relatively friendly ESG company. We did have a score of 82 out of 100, resulting in a total grade of B-. With our 2022 objectives, Polaris aimed for and achieved significant environmental milestones. Number one being surpassing targets in greenhouse <laughs> gas reduction, increasing energy efficiency, and expanding their renewable energy portfolio. Looking ahead, Polaris is on track to meet ambitious environmental goals by 2035, paving the way for a greener future. Polaris has implemented a post-sales surveillance program that utilizes technology to detect quality and safety signals. This policy defines how they'll investigate to ensure safety for their riders. Polaris's Ride Together approach encourages all employees to make a commitment to respect, inclusion, diversity, and equity. Players has a tender management team with their board lacking diversity affecting their overall ESG score. Both Mr. Speetson and Mr. Mack are largely compensated based on performance. However, I'd like to note that a large portion of this compensation is in the form of cash. Now, I'll hand over to Riley for an industry overview. Thanks, Jack. The power sports industry relies heavily on product innovation to attract new customers. With numerous manufacturers competing on price and quality, Brand recognition and reputation are crucial to sustain growth. Increased competition within the industry has led to many companies turning to acquisitions to further boost top line revenue. Polaris had established their business as a premium brand within the power sports industry, primarily competing with BRP and off-road, Harley Davidson and on-road, and Monotune and Marine. We expect Polaris to remain a premium brand, will face increased pressure from growing competitors. I'm going to pass it to Tyler to walk you through our investment thesis. Thank you, Riley. We will now elaborate on why the company's downside is not fully reflected in the stock price. Our investment thesis relies heavily on a comprehensive proprietary survey in which we conducted 98 channel checks to Polaris dealers across the United States. Of the dealers we call, 49% anticipate a sales decrease in calendar year 2024, 36% expect flat sales, and a mere 15% are optimistic about sales. Based on the findings from our proprietary survey, we have identified three key catalysts. Number one, economic and consumer slowdown. Number two, supply chain mismanagement. And number three, structural disadvantage compared to their close competitors. Starting with consumer slowdown, based on our internal survey, we anticipate sales dropping throughout 2024 and won't fully recover until 2026. But why is this? The current combination of the SOFA rate paired with the lowest monthly savings rate since the Great Recession is squeezing consumers. We predict discretionary purchases like Polaris will be the first casualty. Our channel calls also indicated a 50% plus decline in dealership foot traffic. Furthermore, dealers noted the elevated interest rates impact will persist all throughout 2024 and well into 2025. Many potential Polaris buyers face loan rejections due to credit scores, debt to income ratios, and insufficient down payments. When we use history as our guide, the last time the Fed funds rate was above 5%, Polaris significantly underperformed. Due to the high sensitivity of discretionary spending and minimal demand, margins suffered disproportionately. As of their latest earnings call, management lowered 2024 sales guidance to down 7% and EPS guidance to down 15% versus 2023. This is more in line with our channel work as we modeled, modeled out two weeks prior. We modeled sales down 10.7% for the year. EBITDA margins decreased over 100 basis points last year. As seen in the graph, 
High interest rates equate to margin pressure, and we feel there is more room for contraction this year. I'll now give it over to Luke to talk about our second catalyst. Thank you, Tyler. Issues with part sourcing and dealership inventory management have plagued Polaris since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Leadership has downplayed the persistence of these issues in recent quarters as unexpected expenses continue to pile up. Polaris manufactures 100% of their vehicles in North America, however, two-thirds of their supplier network operates internationally. This structure caused production difficulties highlighted during the pandemic, leading to major capital investments in the factory revamps and additional import tariffs of $100 million per year. Dealer inventory continues to be mismanaged through, by Polaris. Through a proprietary survey, we found that a majority of dealerships reported that inventory buildup has now reached levels not seen since 2019. Levels that Polaris pledged they would never meet again. Now Riley will discuss Polaris' competitive disadvantage. Thanks, Luke. Polaris has historically had a strong vote driving innovation within the power sports industry. BRP, Polaris' biggest competitor, disrupted this vote with operational efficiency and the launch of the Can Am Defender in 2015. To expand into adjacent markets and further compete with BRP, Polaris acquired Trans American Auto Parts in 2016. This acquisition failed, however, and they recently exited it for a $600 million loss. As a result, management has shown reluctance to grow via future acquisitions, which we believe will be costly to long-term growth. So what's the significance of these changes? Well, BRP has considerably outperformed Polaris on sales, management effectiveness ratios, and margins over the past decade. As Polaris focuses on improving profitability, we favor BRP's operational efficiency execution driving sales growth. I'll now pass it to Damien to explain our financial analysis. Thank you, Riley. Polaris has a 10-year revenue CAGR of 8.5%. However, due to our proprietary research and the three catalysts listed, we project sales to be down 10.7% in 2024, and in 2025, have a slight rebound of 7.7% growth as discretionary spending rebounds. Gross margins have been in a steady decline since 2014, and we are convicted Margins will continue to fall in 2024 as they face continued pressures due to high fixed costs and their sales decline. Going into 2025, we expect a slight recovery as CapEx shrinks and the demand starts to recover. Here are gross margins from the latest earnings report, and as expected, across the floor, they've been heavily pressured, falling over 300 basis points in each segment over the last year. During a time when goals were set to expand margins further, showing the lack of transparency and execution of Polaris' management. And now, project to discuss liquidity and returns. Thanks, Damien. For Polaris, short term liquidity concerns are highlighted by a consistent decline in inventory turnover, with our channel checks confirming this momentum within the next year. As a result of debt taken on by acquisitions, Polaris is now constrained by higher interest rate payments, limiting their profitability potential. When examining the return analysis on Polaris, we can see the long-term depreciation and management effectiveness ratios. Specifically, when Polaris conducted leadership changes, when BRP released their utility vehicle, and when the 301 tariffs were introduced, all occurring in 2015. Now I'll hand over to Luke for our evaluation. Thank you, Jack. We performed a terminal year growth rate DCF and a terminal year exit EPD with a multiple DCF when conducting our intrinsic valuation. Using financial estimates derived from our proprietary survey, we arrived at a price target of approximately $81 per share. Furthermore, using the same financial estimates, we conducted relative valuations and again arrived at the same approximate price target of $81 per share, representing further multiple contraction. Displayed here are the results of two Monte Carlo simulations based on our DCF price targets using 2024 estimates for revenue growth and gross margins. The red portion of the graphs represent price targets with greater than 10% downside from current prices, while the green portion represents outcomes yielding 10% upside or more. And finally, I will be walking us through the risks associated with our investment recommendation, first of which would be the execution of an economic stock landing by the Federal Reserve, second, the stabilization of the supply chain on both the product sourcing and dealership level, third, the successful integration of outside suppliers into Polaris' network, and fourth, Polaris being able to deliver value to shareholders in an optimal balance between dividends, share repurchases, and capital investment. Finally, I'll pass it on to Tyler for our conclusion. We want to reiterate the sell recommendation on Polaris with a 12-month price target reflect, reflecting potential downside of 12%. With that being said, we'd like to open it up to any questions, and we thank the judges for their time.
say the biggest risk as far as our investor recommendation goes would really be stronger demand on the inside of consumers for the economy, basically economic recovery, achievement of the Fed's monetary policy initiatives. We think that's the biggest risk. So you've got both a macro and a micro set of arguments to drive your sell rating, just to key on that too. Let's just say the macro clears a bit. Are you saying that you would not be a buyer of Polaris and maybe look at their competitor as the stock to buy? Or uh, what, would, what would be another micro catalyst at Polaris that would change your mind? I can take that one again. So I would say primarily the micro catalyst that would change our investment recommendation on Polaris would be initiatives taken towards streamlining their supply chain. So one of the main things we think they have to control over would be their vertical integration and what they choose to do with their capital investments. So what we would like to see from management would be capital being devoted similar to their Walker Evans racing acquisition they made this past year into integrating their supplier network more domestically, just being able to alleviate some of those pressures on manufacturing. Let's imagine I'm on the buy side for a long short uh, fund right now. Uh, who would you prepare for a buy with this? Yeah, I, I can take that one. So we, we prepared Polaris and BRP in the presentation. They're both very uh, similar competitors. So we feel that a buy would be BRP if you wanted to go hair straight up in the short position. You could short Polaris and go on BRP. How did you come up with your uh, relative valuation? Into our relative valuation, we, we wanted to look at the history of the guide. And as you can see on the graph here, we saw similar multiple troughs, at least relatively around the 2008-2009 era and the 2015-2016 era. So while the intensity of the economic pressures that they're facing may not be the same in magnitude as the 2008-2009 area, we think that the combination of factors going on right now from competition just the macro environment in general and the supply issues. We factor all of that in. We think that will essentially is worse. The worst is yet to come. It's what we're seeing. So we anticipate further uh, contraction in the multiple. Uh, Jason, can you just group the headwinds that they're facing into kind of temporary issues like macro and supply chain versus some of the longer tail issues like competitive environment? or lack of innovation and then you know, what's the risk that the market kind of looks through? You know, it still is there down 10 instead of down 7. What's the risk that the market just kind of looks through that and says, yeah, once the channel gets clear, we can put a decent multiple on this again. So I'll touch on long-term headwinds first. Um, so when we look at like the competitive disadvantage that we identified with PRP, um, PRP went public in 2013. In 2015, they launched the Canyon Defender. That got them into the utility segment, which is the biggest market in North America. And since then, like that expansion has been huge for BRP. Um, it's been big for Polaris too. You know, like they highlighted that in the 2015 call, um, noting that like the competitive pressures really picked up in the industry, which had a negative performance on them. So we would say innovation has been a long-term tailwind. Um, I could provide more examples on that front. Secondary, um, we look at like management effectiveness ratios. It's also been in a long-term decline. So we're also more bearish on the management team. And then third, we look at the supply chain. So Polaris has been preaching like this supply chain improvement story, the operating margin improvement story, the profitability story. They've been preaching that since 2015. And I mean, when we pull up like long-term margins, like you're seeing deterioration in the long term. And so we would say that all three of those catalysts are long-term. For short-term catalysts we have is going to be like the high interest rate environments. Additionally, there's been low snowfall. Those have also been catalysts in 2016, 2009, and 2006 when players experienced three years of sales declines. So that's kind of our very time to long term structure. So, so kudos to your uh, channel analysis, but how confident you elaborate on that? Um, how confident are you guys with the, the survey results? Yeah, so we, we are fairly confident within our uh, channel survey results. So like we said, we targeted 98 dealers. So these are 98 people that we spoke to and got concrete information from. Overall, we called probably over 250 dealers, but these are the 98 that we uh, specifically spoke to. So the people we spoke to were you know, a range of people. We talked to sales representatives, we talked to managers of dealerships, we 
we even talked to dealership owners. So we did speak to people that were relatively high up in the food chain of those dealerships. So we are confident in our results. Any questions? Yeah. Within these channel checks, how did you guys factor in kind of the different product mix and the different margins associated with those products to get your open for Yeah, I think that you want to pull up the tell them. So as far as like the different product mix went into our factors for the survey, we wanted to first touch on a wide variety of different dealerships. Within this industry, there's several that will carry multiple different products from competitors, whether that's BRP, whether that's CFO, or another one of their competitors. So we, we wanted to get a nice broad range of what actual products were being held. And then factoring margins into that, as you can see, um, margins have been under significant pressure this past year. And, and we, we attribute a lot of that to something we're going to cover actually in our proprietary survey, which is the discounting that's been going on in a lot of these uh, dealerships. So in the past probably two quarters here, as the inventory has begun to build up, Polaris has taken significant efforts to sort of try to unload the inventory on consumers, probably the demand that they need isn't there. So we've seen a disproportionate effect on margins in the past couple quarters over that as it's been displayed by some of the results we put up here. And then just on M&A, you talked about a one that didn't work out, that a big loss in $10 million and some other that played out well. So how would you weigh management on their M&A overall? I can touch on this. So overall, um, M&A for players like it has been positive. Um, and so I guess what we are highlighting with the Transamerican acquisition is Transamerican is expanding into an adjacent market. So they sell like Jeep, uh, Jeep shop components uh, and also for trucks. Um, so management was expanding into an adjacent market. It didn't work out, it resulted in a $600 million loss. And then when we had our analyst day uh, with the management team, they showed the like, reluctance and more caution in future acquisitions. And so when they're showing us that tone, we have a more bearish outlook on that, um, especially when it's in an industry where inorganic growth is crucial um, as a driver. So that's why we're favoring BRP. Um, they recently made four acquisitions in 2022 to expand into electrification. And so that's a move that we'd like to move forward. So I'm curious, you mentioned the analyst days. I'm wondering if you had already done your channel checks work before or after analyst day. If it was before analyst day, if you had this data, how do you think that changed the way you question the managers? What did you learn that you wouldn't have learned otherwise? And if it was after, I'm curious, what would you want to ask them now that you do have that data? I can start. Yeah, so uh, we we actually took quite a bit of time to do our channel checks. Uh, it wasn't particularly easy to get a lot of these people on the phone and talk to you. So we were completing these channel checks, you know, for let's say three to four months from you know, October until late December, early January. So we didn't really have, I would say, a, a good grip on you know, kind of the story that we had heard within the channel during the analyst day. I mean, we had heard bits and pieces of what was going on you know, in terms of inventory and potential channel stuffing and definitely the sale of the client, but it wasn't as concrete as you know, when we finished our 98 channel calls. Yeah, I just like to add something on that. So I can say um, one issue that we hadn't really realized was still persisting with Polaris would be the supply chain issues. We had just assumed since it had been three years since the initial uh, pandemic shutdowns that they overcome those issues and sort of adapted to it. But at the analyst day, that was a major point of topic was continued efficiency costs piling up even into the current present. So we, we had to really consider inventory as being a really factor to pursue uh, questions on at the dealership level. But after the analyst day, we really wanted to press on inventory levels to see trends had things continue to pile up, we're really looking at comparison to pre-COVID levels because that was something they also preached. They hadn't wanted to return to those levels because the demand isn't there like it was back then. So the inventory, in short, I guess, became a major factor we wanted to look at after the analyst day. And I'll just add that we left all of our questions consistent whether it was before or after analyst day just to keep everything in line so that we could base it on more content.